This morning we're, uh, we're going to be in Acts chapter 2. So if you have your Bibles, why don't you turn with me there. Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. And, um, you know what, I'm going I'm to ask, can, can we do something in, uh, Can we do something we don't normally do? Can we just all stand for the reading of God's word this morning? Out of reverence for, uh, for the, the truth of God's word, the truth of the scriptures. And uh, let's, let's just uh, listen to these things. Uh, with hearts of faith and worship this morning. It says in verse 42, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending in the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. This is the word of the Lord, our food for this morning. You may be seated. Well, friends, uh, we are continuing our series entitled Longing to Belong and Pressing In to Biblically Saturated Gospel-Centered Community. And this morning, uh, we are hungry for it. I don't know if you felt it, you sensed it, but our hearts long for community. We're hungry for it. And, and I've got a good word for you. If you are hungry for those things and you're sensing that, the Word of God gives us a promise. In Psalm 107, uh, verse 9, our theme verse for the year, it says this, For he satisfies the longing soul, and the hungry he fills with good things. And when we come to the Lord with our hungry hearts, our longing souls, he longs to fill those things, and, and we're hungry today. Our hearts long for the things that we're going to be pressing into today, and we're hungry for community. Um, but can I tell you, the world is too. The people that we live with, our, our communities are hungry for it. Our nation is hungry for it. Our world longs for community. I mean, think of, uh, think of just uh, TV series that you, uh, that you experience. I mean, it's, it's all about community so many times. You think of Friends and Seinfeld or The Office or Parks and Recreation or, uh, or even the, the, the TV series Community that, uh, that was on for about six years, right? Uh, for, for those of you who didn't know that, uh, that, that specific series, um, um, Community uh, was, was about a former lawyer who attends a community college when it is discovered that he faked his, his bachelor's degree. degree. And, and so, so uh, as, as he, he goes, goes back, back to this community college, he finds a girl, starts to uh, try and date her uh, from his Spanish class, and, and, and he, to do so, he pretends to form a study group, right? And... Uh, he thinks he's going to have her all to himself. Well, no, nah, not so much. She invited another student who awkwardly invites half of the Spanish class, uh, and, uh, and the entire uh, group is there. Now, more people attending the study group and the eclectic group of misfits, uh, which have many differences between them, soon become close friends, and they form an unlikely community. And uh, if, if you, you love that, that show, show, some of you are like, I didn't even see, see that show at, at all. Some, some of you loved it, and you're like, I miss community, right? Well, well you're in luck, because NBC, NBC said in 2022 uh, that, that they're going to be, uh, they're, they're working on a full-length feature film that's in the works right now, right? So you're going to get more of your community fix. But I'm going to tell you, friends, as the followers of Jesus Christ, as the church of Jesus Christ, we, we hunger, hunger for, for community, community too, but, but, but the, the community, community that we have in the Lord, the community that is in, in biblical, biblical community, community that is after the heart of Jesus and founded on the gospel of Jesus and has the people of God really is so much better uh, than what the, the, what the world can even hope to have. A biblical community, Christ-centered community, is loving relationship with the people of God based on the person of God, to fulfill the purposes of God. And I don't know about you, when you hear that, you're like, well, what does it look like? What does it look like in, in reality? Like, if, if we're supposed to have biblical community and gospel-saturated community, what is that supposed to look like? Well, we get that in our passage today. We get that in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. And so if you haven't turned there, I invite you to turn with me uh, there right now. 
and we're going to see the characteristics of Christ-centered community, the characteristics of Christ-centered community. And what does it look like? Well, let's begin with this point this morning. Uh, the first characteristic we see is this, a Christ-centered community is it commits to the core essentials. It commits to the core essentials. Notice in verse 42 again, it says this, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And so what you have is you have the early church, the believers. This is just a brand new existence, a brand new birth that started at Pentecost, founded on the gospel of Jesus Christ when he gave his life at the cross and rose again victoriously. And then at Pentecost, the Spirit of God came down to the church that was gathering there, filled them, and, and, and the church was born. The church began, and this community that was filtered through the gospel, founded on the gospel, and centered around Jesus was powerful. It was enticing. It was, it was so, uh, so, uh, so amazing. The world had never seen something as awesome as this. And what characterized it was this. It says that they devoted themselves to some stuff, right? They put some covenants before them. They weren't just a, a social club, right? They weren't just a holy huddle or a frozen chosen gathered together. They weren't just sitting around playing cards all day, though game nights are fun too. I'm sure they had a couple game nights around the dreidel. But, you know, uh, they, uh, they were committed to some core essentials. And that changed the, the focus of that group. That that, that, that marked who they were. Christ-centered community commits to the core essentials. What did they commit themselves to and devote themselves to? It says first, the apostles' teaching. That's the Word of God. They committed themselves to the Word of God. Now, friends, we have to understand, at that time, they had the Old Testament canonized. They had the Old Testament scriptures that they knew and that they taught and that they had been brought up in, but then they had Jesus they had God in the flesh who dwelt with the apostles and lived with the apostles for three and a half years. And, and he taught publicly, and they heard and soaked it all in, and then he taught them privately as well. And he is translating the Old Testament, teaching them about how the scriptures spoke about him, and he's introducing them to this new community of love and fellowship based on a new covenant in his blood. And, and they, they committed, committed themselves to that teaching that came from the apostles as they taught about Jesus, as they taught about the gospel, and as they taught about this new community. In fact, they didn't even know sometimes that the very things that they were writing down in letters would actually become the very word of God itself. But it was recognized over time. They committed themselves to those letters. And they committed themselves to the word of God. That's what a Christ-centered community does. But, but it's, it's not, not just knowing the word, right? It's, it's not, not just becoming like Bible fatheads where we're like, I got to learn all the verses and I got to learn all the dates and I got to learn all the stuff. And we start to just sit in these study groups and we're all in these study groups and it's all about just learning, learning, learning. It's about transformation as well. They devoted themselves not only to hearing the word and learning the word and believing the word, but also living according to it. And it transformed their life and their community. They commuted, uh, committed themselves to the core essentials of the word. They also committed themselves to the fellowship, the fellowship. Now, friends, this was a beautiful experience that only believers can have, right? Because it's a relational unity that comes around the gospel. And it's that sense that we have. Have you ever walked into a party or walked into a new experience and you're like, I know no one in this room, right? You're looking around hoping you have uh, anyone that you can go, I know them, I've, I've seen them from somewhere. But then as you're in that, you, you have a little bit of insecurity. You're not sure what to do there, but then you find somebody who knows Jesus, right? And doesn't your heart just jump within you? You're like, you're a Christian, I'm a Christian too. And then and you're like, I know Jesus, I love Jesus, you know Jesus, you love Jesus. And it's that fellowship that we have. I'm telling you, friends, you, you can't have that in, 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 in relationships with the world. This is a fellowship that only happens between the people of God, and it's beautiful. There's this unity that comes, this relational connection that comes, and this partnership as well, as we are about the same things and committed to the same things, going after the great commission of Jesus, being about the great commandments in our midst, and it's gathering together with intent and purpose. And the early, early church, church gathered, gathered themselves around that. They committed to those core essentials. But it wasn't just that. It, it, it also said the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, 
and to the breaking of bread. The breaking of bread. Do you know what this is? This is communion. Friends, they gathered around the Lord's Supper. And that was so central, right? In, in fact, it was one of the two things that, um, that Jesus gave us, the two main. I remember a guy in my small group years ago, he, 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 he told the whole small group. He's like, I don't understand how it's so difficult. Jesus gave us two things. He's like, two things. He said, be baptized and, and take communion, right? It's like totally easy. And I said, hey, brother, when are you going to get baptized? <laughs> right? Well, he's, he's baptized, baptized now, now, praise, praise the Lord. Lord. But uh, they, they committed, committed themselves to communion, celebrating the death and the burial and the resurrection of their Savior, the, the, the atoning sacrifice of the life of, of, of Jesus given uh, for his followers to gather around the Lord's Supper. Man, uh, when was the last time you did that at work, right? Do you have that kind of community at work? Did you have that kind of community at your last school board meeting? You know, just breaking out the L? No, you can't. This is fellowship that only the body of Christ can experience. Christ-centered community commits itself to the core essentials of the word, of fellowship, communion, and also it says the prayers. This is a, a, this is a church family, a church community committed to prayer. And, and not just any prayer. Yes, were they praying alone? Were they praying in their, their prayer rooms, in their closets, as Jesus had told them? Or were they calling out to the Lord regularly, daily? Yes, they were doing that. I don't know about you, but uh, maybe some of you, you have, a, you have a time set aside in the morning when you go and you get with Jesus. You know, you got your chair, you got your coffee, you got your devotional, and it's just the two of you, right? And you just, you just have some great time. Or maybe your time's in the evening. Maybe some of you are like morning and evening. Or maybe some of you are just like, I'm all throughout the day. I walk in utter communion with the Lord all the time. Praise the Lord for that. This was also, though, they were gathering together to pray. They were getting together to pray, and they were going for the prayers. And what were the prayers? Well, we get a little insight into that in Psalm 55, uh, 55 verse 17. The psalmist there says this, But I call to God, and the Lord will save me. Evening and morning and at noon I utter my complaint and moan, and he hears my voice. Evening and morning and at noon, you hear that in, in other places in the scriptures as well, because that was the practice of temple worship. That was the practice of the community of God gathering together for prayer. If you were a part of Judaism, you know that prayer happened at 9 a.m., at, at noon, and then at 3 p.m., and there were prayer gatherings. And so if you wanted to go to the church and you wanted to pray with God's people, man, they were there calling out to the Lord. And they committed themselves to that. They were devoted to just praying. And so as they had opportunity, continuing to call out and gather in prayer, Christ-centered community commits to the core essentials of the word, fellowship, communion, and prayer. Are you committed to those things? Are you committed to those things? If, if we're, as Grace Community, going to be a Christ-centered community, we as individuals need to commit to these things too. How, are, are you committed, committed to the word? word? Some of you are like, eh, I could take it or leave it. it. It's okay, right? I'm not even sure it's from Jesus. No, no, no. These are the holy scriptures. These are the God-breathed, God-inspired word of God, inerrant. And this is the, 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 the truth and, and the blessing that we have that, that has been given by God. These are his love letters to us to instruct us on how we should live, how we should believe, what we should be about in this world and how we fulfill our purpose. Or, 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 or what about fellowship? Some of you are like, eh, I could take it or leave it, you know? Some of you are like, eh, I'm not committed to fellowship, hanging out with the church, coming for worship, right? I, I remember early on in the church, right, when we were planting the church, so real small at the time, you know, uh, only, you know, only, uh, I think, a year, 18 months or something like that. And I remember extending my hand to somebody, and I was like, hey, man, how you doing? Uh, I, are you new around here? My name's Pastor Mike. What's your name? And he said, no, I'm a regular attender. <laughs> there's like no one at the church at the time because it's a church plan and it's starting up and i'm like i'm pretty sure i would have known you if you were a regular attender right yeah i'm not sure about it. he's like no nope, i've been here i've been here check your record i was like all right well i apologize for not knowing your name i'm gonna i'm gonna work at that so um wouldn't you know what i went back that week checked the records and, and he was regularly attending twice a year 
once every six months, months you know? He's, he's one, one of those priester type, type people, and, 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 you know, where it's just like Christmas and Easter. And friends, somewhere along the line, we think, think regularly attending church is like, you know, when I feel like it. Or, or, or twice uh, a year, right? Regular attending church is like when I'm in oh, every week, I'm coming and being part of the, the people of God, and I'm there gathering, and, and maybe I'm out of town for something, but I'm communing with the people of God and, and connecting as much as I can, and I'm bringing the worship that the Lord requires, the Lord deserves, and my heart so desperately needs with the people of God. I'm committed to that. Are you? Are you committed to that corporate prayer and, 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 and communion and the fellowship with his people? Christ-centered committed, uh, community is committed to the core essentials. Here's the second thing we see here about Christ-centered community. The second characteristic is, is that uh, it wonders at the works of God. It wonders at the works of God. Notice what was going on in verse 43. And awe came upon every soul. Now, I love that. I love that word because it says exactly what it is, like awe, right? Uh, in fact, can we just say that together? Listen to this word when we say it. All right, go ahead. Say it. Awe, right? All right, but I think it's, I think it's even more awesome than, than that. Can we say it one more time? Say it. Awe, right? They were feeling this sense of awe. Their mouths were open. They were shocked. They were just amazed as they were seeing the hand of God at work. And it, and it says, says that uh, awe, awe came, came upon, upon every soul, and many signs and wonders were being done through the apostles. That's awesome, because they were seeing the hand of God working. In, fa in fact, if you go over to Hebrews, uh, Hebrews will tell you that the reason God was doing so many miracles through Jesus and so many miracles through the apostles as they were founding this brand new church was that so that people would be confirmed in their understanding that this was not just some flash in the pan gathering some new uprising of people who had some some weird doctrine but no this was the work of God in their midst and he was confirming it to their hearts through the signs and wonders the miracles that the that the the uh, the, the, the apostles were performing you know when they were feeding the hungry or when the blind man was getting healed or when the lame man was rising up and walk walking and leaping and praising God you know or when the the guy died and then his wife died when they lied, lied to the holy spirit i mean like there was some powerful mighty works being done in their midst and people were just sent the presence, the presence of God. God. They, they were, were feeling this sense of awe. This, oh my goodness, how awesome is the Lord. And I, 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 there, there was this sense of fear, but this sense of reverence and this sense of just, man, he is just so powerful and so amazing as they were seeing the hand of God at work and sensing the awesomeness of God. Now I praise God because we've seen that too. We've seen some awesome works of God. We've seen some miracles and some healings. I remember praying over one woman with stage four cancer. God healed her. That was pretty awesome. I remember when the elders uh, anointed someone with oil and prayed over them for their epileptic seizures. They went and got a doctor confirmation of the healing that happened in, in her. It was powerful to see. God's done those things, and, and he continues to move. But it's not all miracles and just healing like that. God does awesome things. There was amazing provisions. I mean, powerful provi provisions. I could tell you about this one time when, um, when early on in the church, some of you, many of you don't know, know this, uh, this story, but this is like, this is like a Grace Community Church lore, right? If you want a little, a little inside uh, information or, or some of the story of God at work. There was one, uh, one uh, a season where we were going through the budget, going through the numbers, and we were just um, looking, going like, hey, I don't think the numbers are adding up. We're going to come way short this year. And we saw a $26,000 shortfall in, in the first six months of the year. And um, as best as we could know, it seemed like the church was giving faithfully. People were uh, just giving to the work of the Lord there. And we just said, hey, if you're not, please join with us. Let's just, let's just be faithful. But but we think everybody is, is honoring the Lord in this respect. And so we called the church to fasting and prayer. Now, now, if you've been, been part of Grace Community, Community it's, it's, it's rare the amount of times that we call the church and, and tell the church, hey, church, we need to fast together and we need to pray. Now, some of you are like, thank you, because I didn't know if this was like, you know, part of the initiation rites around here. You always got to fast for that kind of stuff. Um, fast as the Lord leads you into it. 
But sometimes we have to call the church to pray, and that was one of them. And we called the church to fasting and prayer. That Sunday we stood up, we shared the story, we said, hey, everybody seems to be giving great. Um, let's ask the Lord. We need the Lord's, we need the Lord's blessing. And, and internally, I didn't tell anybody this, but if it didn't come through, I mean, like, pastor probably would have had to take another job or something because it, it was it was that that dire. But we didn't share that side of it. We just said, hey, let's, we're, we're going to trust the Lord, right? And so we all began to pray. We all began to fast. That was Sunday right after church. Wouldn't you know, I walk into the office on Tuesday morning, and my assistant comes in, and she slides two checks onto my desk. Now, I'm going to tell you, I don't see the checks and uh, all the money that comes in for tithes and offerings at this church, okay? My assistants don't do that on a normal basis. But this was a powerful one because these checks were from outside the church. These were people we had no idea. They didn't even know about this situation. The first check was for $1,000. It was a former elder, a former member of, and, and his family that felt led for some reason. The Lord put it on their heart to give. And then there was a second check for $25,000. From somebody who had no connection to Grace Community. Yeah. God heard the prayers of his people. And in fact, the awesome thing is to know that God knew what he was going to do. He's like, this is going to be awesome. They're going to start praying. They're going to start fasting. I'm, I'm just going to confirm. If you, ever, if you ever doubt that Jesus is real and God is alive and his working in his church, man, you see stuff like that and you're like, oh, right? You're like, total awe. God is awesome. And he's at work. It's, it's awesome, awesome to behold. And, 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 and how, how many, many stories could we have told about just the way God, God gave favor or God provided the right person at the right time for the right purpose when we were getting into this facility? I mean, it was over and over and the abundant provision that God provided. It was just powerful. And that's awesome to be a part of a church like that. And, and friends, I'll tell you, when, when a church is committed to the core, they're honoring Jesus, lifting up his name, proclaiming the gospel, preaching the word, and being about fellowship and communion and prayer. I'm telling you, God's at work. God works, and he's doing some awesome things, and it's awesome to behold. Christ-centered community commits to the core essentials. It wonders at the works of God. You know what? There is one. I just got to share this story as well, too. So we had, a, we had one of our, our members reach out. Uh, he wasn't at, at church um, on, uh, on kickoff Sunday, but he, he sent me an email after. He said, he said this. He said, Pastor Mike, I had something interesting happen on Sunday, September 10th. We hadn't gone to church that day. I love that little confession to start the, start the email. That's good. It's good for the soul, right? He said, later that evening, I wanted to watch your message online. I started watching, and you were preaching on Psalm 107. I got to say, I almost jumped off the couch. So the reason being, I had a dream on Monday, September 4th, which was about Psalm 107. I had been praying that night after I went to sleep. I had this dream where an angel or, or the Lord, I, I'm not sure which one, was saying something about the Psalms, that it was important. All I could remember from the dream, I was shown three numbers, Psalm 107, Psalm 95, and Psalm 93. And he said, Psalm 107 was the most important and that I needed to read it first, then the others. So I got up that morning and I read Psalm 107, Psalm 95, then Psalm 93. Psalm 107 really hit me for some reason. But I was, wasn't sure why the Lord was putting that particular one on my mind. I read it a few times in the others, but still felt, it, it still felt confused why he put Psalm 107 as the one to really take note of. Then I saw you preaching this very psalm this last Sunday, Psalm 107. And you were preaching about hunger, and it all fell into place. I understood what God was trying to say. Your message made it clear for our, parti our particular situation. It's the hunger on having companionship and fellowship with other Christians. And it's the hunger to seek out God, to seek his word, and to lean in on him instead of ourselves because we fail every time, even though we think we've got it figured out. Anyway, I thought I'd share this with you because it's pretty amazing to me how God works things out. I needed to hear from him, had been praying to hear from him, and this happened through, through the dream. Hearing your message really explained it to me. Our Lord is pretty amazing. Anybody think that God's pretty amazing? I'm telling you, we had so many stories similar to this of just people coming up going like, God was leading me. Or somebody just, I just heard a, a, another sermon on Psalm 107. Or somebody was talking about Psalm 107 on the radio. It literally Tuesday morning afterwards, the reading of the day was on Psalm 107. 
I'm telling you, like, it was just all over the place, just God going, I'm leaving you, I'm leaving you, I'm leaving you. Those are awesome times. I want to be a part of that community, right? I want to be part of a church where God is moving so clearly and so evidently. That's a Christ-centered community. It commits to the core essentials, wonders at the works of God, and then it also cares through communism. You hear that? Cares through communism. I know you're all looking at sideways at me. Let's, let's get it from the Word. It says this, And all who believed were together. Now I'm going to stop there for a second and just say together. Together is so important. You're not going to experience community in your life. And the blessing of that community all by yourself, all alone, just in your car, or just in your basement, or just by yourself. Community happens together. And the blessing that God wants to get, that hunger in your heart for the connection and the belonging, happens as we press in, as we come close, and we engage into the church community, as we give it another try, trusting the Lord again, saying, God, my heart was hurt before, but I want to trust you, and I want to be restored in you, and I need this, Lord. And it's, that's where we find it, when we're together when we spend time with each other in worship or serving or game nights or small groups or men's events and women's gatherings or, 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 or prayer and praise nights. In fact, we've got a prayer and praise night coming up on October the 11th. Man, just a time to fellowship, a time to seek the Lord in prayer, but a time of seeking the presence of God. I'm, I don't know about you, my heart is hungry for more of the manifest presence of God in, in, in and through worship. I'm longing for that, and, and, and we're, we're gathering, gathering together. together. So I, I mark, mark it out in your calendar. calendar. October 11th is going to be a great a time of prayer and praise together. But they, they were together. together. Verse 44, all who believed were together, and here it is, and had all things in common. They had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Now, friends... Welcome, Welcome to Grace, Grace Community. Community. We're going to be beginning a commune following the service if you'd like to sign up for it. <laughs> right? That's, That's not what we're, we're talking, talking about here. That's, That's not what the Bible's talking, talking about. about. They, they held, held all things in common, common right? It's, it's communism, communism, not communism, which seems to be for some crazy reason, seems to be a, like, a, like, a, a, like a fad right now. Like people are like, oh, we should become more communist. And communism is like this idyllic society. And you're like, for, for all, all of the older generations who fought against communism and those the ills of communism, or those who have immigrated to our country legally from a communist nation, you were like, wow, there is such a blessing here. You don't want to go there because you know bread lines and poverty and then an elite people who have all the money and take advantage of the other people. I'm sorry, I'll get off my soapbox now. You just, well, in fact, why don't you say, Pastor, get off your soapbox. Say it. All right, I'm, I'm off, off my soapbox. You heard my soapbox. But, but it's, it's, not com it's, it's not communism. The, the Bible doesn't teach communism, and it's not teaching that. that. Communism, communism is what's yours is mine. And we take yours, and we give it to everyone, everyone right? right? And, and, and friends, friends, that is, that is horrific for community. community. What, what that, that is is that's theft, and, and that, that is breaking boundaries, boundaries and it destroys community. It destroys individualism, and it destroys community as well. It's horrible, all right? You do, do not, not want, want communism. And if you are a young adult or you are a, a student and, and someone's teaching you that from our schools or institutions or you're hearing it from crazy politicians, just in your mind go, I got to go talk to grandpa. I got to go talk to grandma and get, get the scoop, right? They will fill you in. All right, I'm back off my soapbox again. Sorry. <laughs> the Bible doesn't teach communism. It rather teaches communism. Very different. Common, communism says what's yours is mine, and it takes. Communism says what's mine is yours, and it offers freely. It chooses to say, I'm going to bless, and I'm going to meet the needs of others, the legitimate needs. And that's the beauty of the body of Christ. It is saying, you know what? All the stuff that I have, it is not more valuable than the people of God. 
And, and, and if people are in such a bad way and they are in such dire straits that, that they are hurting or, or if we're like the New Testament church and the, the, the culture is against their movement and persecuting them and causing them to lose their jobs, causing them to lose their income, causing them to lose their homes, we're going to band together as the people of God. We're going to go, you know what, I have an extra car. I'm going to sell that thing so you can eat next uh, the, for, the, for the next couple weeks, right? And, 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 and if you need to come in and move in in my basement, that's fine. I live in a townhome. It's not very big, but we'll make it work. It'll be a happy little home as we love Jesus. And the whole point of communism is going, there is, like, the American dream is not the essential. Like, having this American dream where we build up this, you know, this giant uh, fortune and we're building up all this notoriety and we're building up all that, like, that's not supreme. We recognize, and friends, listen, it is not bad to be blessed with riches. It is not. Money is not the root of evil. It's the love of money that is the root of evil, right? And so if God is blessing work of your hands, praise the Lord for that. Praise the Lord. And, and I love what it says in 1 Timothy 4 where it says that every good gift that we receive from the Lord is to be received with gratefulness if it is received through uh, the, the word of God and prayer. Like we thank the Lord for the blessings he has in our lives, but then we put them in their right place. We put them in their right place and we go, you know what? The people of God are more important than all of my stuff. And when the people of God are hurting, I'm hurting because I'm part of community. And when they're going through the weeds, man, I'm going through the weeds with them. Right? And, and I'm, I'm going to be there with them. And, and I'm not just going to be like, oh, sucks to be you. I'm, I'm doing my own thing. thing right? No, no that's, that's not what we're, what we're about. We're, we're about communism. And we care for one another. And we are known, as Jesus said, by our love. And that's the heart of the people. And we care for one another through communism. That's why the church has a benevolence fund. That's why the church cares. Why Why we take up uh, an offering in, uh, in I think it's May, and then again in, in November. We're going to be taking up a benevolence offering again this coming November. Why? So that the people who are hurting in our body, the people who are hurting in our community, can be cared for in those moments of crisis, in those moments of need. That's what the church is about. And friends, that kind of care is countercultural. That kind of care is powerful. It speaks to a world, and they look in and they go, man, we need to figure that out. We need, to, we need more of that, because whatever they're doing, they really care for their people well. Right? The church of Jesus Christ and a Christ-centered community cares through communism. I'll tell you a story that happened in our church. I love it. Um, we had one guy who was... Uh, he, he, was, uh, he came to the church. He said, man, I got a job. I'm working hard, and yet, I, you know, not making ends meet here. I really need a, jo- a car to be able to get to work. And so he brought that need to the deacons, and the deacons were kind of meeting with him, counseling him, going through his finances and helping him figure out where he could, where he could work. But you know what? You know what was awesome? There was another family in the church. The family in the church had an extra car, and they were buying a new car, and you know, as we typically do, I'm sure they were thinking, how much could I get? How much will the dealer get? How much could I get if I sell it, oh, you know, uh, sell it myself? And the Lord just knocked on their heart. You ever had that experience happen? And the Lord just kind of goes, hey, remember, I gave you that as a gift. I need that for some other purpose. And the Lord knocked on their heart, and they're like, they came to the church, and they're like, we're not sure exactly why, but, you know, the Lord gave us a car, and we, we want to give it to the church for somebody who needs a car. <laughs> well, wouldn't, wouldn't you know, it was that week that that, that gentleman came to the deacons and was like, I need a car. And we're like, Jesus. Jesus, right? Jesus showed up because he knew the need. And there's legitimate needs. Now, friends, what communism is not teaching is that, you know, 50% of us are going to work hard and we're going to earn all the money and then 50% of us can sit on our couch and, you know, live in our bas- the basement of our parents for the rest of our life. That's That's not not communism, communism, right? right? That That might might be communism, communism, actually, but that's that's not communism. communism. 
That, that is, is unloving, unloving and, and irresponsible. And the Bible actually speaks about that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. No, no, no. This is a hardworking community who are seeking to be honoring the Lord in all respects and doing our parts. And then when somebody is legitimately hurting, coming alongside them and meeting those needs in Jesus. And that's awesome to be part of a community that cares like that, right? It's awesome to see. And that's Christ-centered community. It commits to the core essentials. It wonders at the works of God. It cares through communism. And then lastly, it worships and walks together. Worships and walks together. Look at this, verse 46. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. A Christ-centered community worships and walks together. What you see in this passage is something that is repeated like five or six times in the book of Acts. It talks about where the church could be found, right? And it says, in the temple and from house to house. In the temple and from house to house. Where were they? They were in the temple and they were house to house. Now, if you were part of Judaism, you met in the temple. That was your life, right? Everything was around the temple. And you went to the temple and you worshiped the temple. You gave your offerings at temple. You, uh, you talked with people at the temple. You heard the word at temple. And, and you did your, your, your spiritual thing at the temple. And then you went back to your regular life. But something changed when, when Jesus came. Something powerful happened when Jesus came. He started a new Christian community based on love, a community that would be deeper and that would be more impactful, a, a, a community that just didn't look at the externals but went uh, down deep to the heart. And Jesus uh, actually uh, started to transform their lives so that it wasn't just in the temple, which we do that, right? We gather to worship, right? We gather to worship on Sundays. We gather for prayer. We gather uh, to uh, meet in, uh, and, and, and just to worship Jesus together, to fellowship together, to take communion together, and to pray together. We meet for that. But at the same time, Jesus said, now you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are a temple of the Holy Spirit. You are a temple of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit took up residence within the people at, 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 at Pentecost. It was powerful. The Spirit of God came and the Spirit of God baptized them and filled them to fullness. Just like we are filled with the Spirit of God himself. And we've received his Spirit and we are temples. So that means everywhere we go, everywhere we go, we've got temple with us. Everywhere we go, we are connecting and communing from house to house as well as in the temple. And here's the beauty of it. The beauty of meeting house to house and gathering, all of a sudden there's more intimacy. There's more fellowship that's happening on a street level connection, right? Because it's not just putting on a face. How many think it's easy to put on a face for an hour and a half? Eh, pretty easy, right? You could show up, everybody could be like, hey, how you doing this week? Good. But your car's not working, your, di your dog died, your family's all sick, your bank account's drained, and you're like, I'm good, right? Really? That sounds like horrible. That sounds like the worst week ever. Well, maybe not ever, but. Or, or, or maybe, maybe you come into church and, you're, and, you, and, and your life has been just so not victorious that week. And you've stumbled into sin again. And you're like, no, I'm, I'm good. Or, or maybe even worse, you just don't even come. But you're like, nah, I, 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 I got to clean myself up first. Friends, when, the, when, when it's not just a Sunday gathering and it's not all about the show, and it's really about street-level discipleship and getting into each other's lives, man, we meet from house to house, and, and it begins to be more intimate. Because as we're in each other's homes, I see how you treat your wife and how your kids respond to you. I, I see, see whether your house is clean, clean, whether it's a sty, really. I, I see, see, you know, I see your real life, not just what you've manufactured, manufactured for an hour and a half. And the whole idea is that community, the community of Jesus, is to be a place where your heart is really being transformed. And your life is really being an, I, impacted. And here's the beauty. In the midst of community, your life is being changed. And as you draw near, as you come close, as you experience this biblical 
a Christ-centered community, your life begins to change as people's lives are rubbing off on your life and people's faith is rubbing off on your faith. The worshiping and walking together, gathering for worship, doing life together. They were receiving their food. So much uh, of ministry, so much of connection happens around food. How good is that? They received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. They had glad and generous hearts. Why? Because their lives were changed by the gospel. They experienced the grace and the generosity of God towards them. They experienced the Christ-centered community in all of its glory as God is moving and working. And their hearts were just overflowing. And I'll tell you, friends, when you have that experience and you experience genuine community and you just love it. And you're going to church and you're participating in church. You're gathering with people house to house in small groups. When you're connecting in ministry and you're knowing people and they're knowing your life. Man, it changes your heart. Heart. And that bonding and that connection is, is just meeting the very hunger and the need of your heart. And your life is transformed in community. And it's powerful, friends. Because what happened in the New Testament is changed lives, changed lives. Changed lives, changed lives. And friends, that's the beauty of the church. That's how the church continued to expand, continued to grow as changed lives. We're changing lives, finding favor, because they were like looking at that community going, wow, they've got something going on there. I mean, they may have some squirrely beliefs. I, I only have the Old Testament. I don't know about this Jesus thing. But man, you cannot debate the fact that they love each other well. And they care for their people. And they have some commitments that, man, we could really learn, stand to learn from. And man, I'll tell you, God seems to, if you don't believe in God, you need to go there, because... God seems to be working. Change lives. Change lives. The characteristics of Christ-centered community. Friends, what, what kind of church experience do you want? What kind of church experience do you want? Are, are you the person who's just like, man, I, I just want a little church, little Jesus. I want the, I want the pastor who preaches, you know, three points in a prayer, 15 minutes tops. I, 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 want, I want McDonald's church, right? I want the drive through experience, order as you go, go when I want, when I feel like it, and I just want to pull through, get my word, get out, and get on my, with my life, right? I'll tell you, your heart's hungry for so much more than that. The longing within you is hungry for so much more connection, so much deeper relationship and communion with the fellowship of believers. Your heart is longing for a Christ-centered community. So press in. Press in, friends. Get involved in a small group. Get involved in a women's study. Get involved with the men's, uh, men's ministry meeting on Tuesday nights or on Saturday mornings. Go to the men's retreat coming up. Get connected. Get around people. Be together with the people of God. Don't just say, hi, everything's good. No, no, no. It's not always good. Sometimes it's really good, right? Sometimes it's not. And you need somebody to come around you. So press in. Open up. Be vulnerable. And let's do church the way God designed it to be. By God's grace. Let's pray.